you want me to go first? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can go. Hi, y'all. Yeah. I hope everybody's doing so good today. And I hope everybody's staying well and staying mentally strong today. Um, this is really a rad opportunity just to connect as community and you know while we figure out whether it's business as usual or survival mode it's nice to like connect with more people in our community about stuff that we find interesting and just new ways to look at the world right now especially with all this free time a lot of us have um so welcome everyone um we're excited to have uh, greg smith here from portland autobahn um and we'll be leading a birding basic so i am really excited to hear all about it yeah Thank you. Thank, thank all of y'all. Um, appreciate it. I'm Greg Smith. Uh, they, them, he, him. Um, yeah, I am trying this out as a new way to connect with people and see like how we can share info. Um, I turn to birds more, most often when I'm looking for pla uh, places to kind of like gain some mindfulness and connect with the outside. And I think hopefully there's some solace in like going outside and staring at a downy woodpecker do its thing for like five minutes and realize that natural rhythms are still going on um, despite everything else around us. Um, yeah, I guess I will introduce myself a little bit and kind of like, let's see how this platform works. Um, I had some ideas of like, maybe since it's a small group, not putting everybody on mute or if you wanna go on mute, go for it. Um, and Maybe opening it up if you uh, Greg, Greg, before you continue, yeah. I'm gonna unmute uh, Marisha if you yeah. want to oh. introduce yourself. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, I'm gonna try to unmute you, but it doesn't look like it's working. Uh, Marisha made a note to everyone in the group chat that um, her mic isn't working. Uh, I and a bit of an intro there if you open up the chat on the bottom. Yeah. So Marisha goes by MJ, pronouns she, her. And I'm going to read in first person. I'm actually really interested in what a virtual birding lesson looks like. I work for Holt Arboretum, and this could be transferable to some plant tours you're hoping to do. Um, and I love great blue herons. <laughs> That's awesome. yeah. Thank you. Thanks, MJ. Right. So, yeah, if... So I'm thinking as right now, and uh, Mercy chime in. Uh, if you have a question while I'm going through my things, maybe just like a little hand point, um, or a little raise of the hand, and I'll pause. If that seems a little like chaotic, maybe just writing questions in the chat, and at the end of it, I can get back to it. Um, and yeah, I, I think anything else, Mercy, as far as like that kind of uh, clerical stuff to make this run as smooth I as think possible. that sounds great. If you have background noise, um, just mute yourself till then, because I'm going to mute myself because I'm sitting next to a window. And then, yeah, you could do the hand raising and also write something in the chat. And Greg, are you able to see the chats? I am not right now. Do you no. see at the bottom of your screen, does it say manage participants? Ooh, let's see. Oh, because you're in your slideshow. I'm on my slideshow, yeah. Okay, no worries. How about I help you out with the questions on the side? Does that sound good? That sounds so cool. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, take it away. All right, uh, where to begin? I think uh, I just wanted to start off with like introducing myself and how I've entered this world of birding and birds in general. I am originally from New York City. Um, I grew up uh, in Queens and kind of lived in a city where like it doesn't seem like nature is a little bit put back and or it doesn't exist there and I went to zoo camp as a kid at the Bronx Zoo and that kind of blew my mind and I was like wait a minute there are birds absolutely everywhere and where this park is it's at the tip of New York City State the Bronx River flows north south and it's the perfect place for birds traveling throughout migration so when I was there as a kid you would just see tons and tons of tons of birds out there. Um, so I know my first, birders often talk about like the first twitch bird, the bird that like got them, got them into birds. Um, and for me, it's a tufted, a bird called a tufted titmouse. Uh, we don't get them on the West Coast, but they occur on the East Coast. They're related to chickadees. Um, and that kind of like did it for me. Uh, in high school, I did 
an internship at the Bronx Zoo again for like all four of my years there. I uh, went to college in Maine and then got into seabirds. So for the past 10 years, I've been working as a avian biologist, uh, mostly working with birds that have webbed feet, uh, nest in large colonies, and uh, feed their chicks tons of gross fish and poop all over you. Um, so that's been a lot of my life, uh, is being covered in guano and uh, measuring chicks and identifying birds on the fly. Um, so that's kind of my thing. I've been doing that for about uh, 10 years now. And past couple of years, I've been working with Wild Diversity in Audubon on ways to kind of reach communities that are often left out when it comes to wildlife conservation and in the sciences. I've worked in the field for like 10 years now, and I've only worked with one person of color throughout that entire time. Um, so I have realized how important it is to kind of reach out and reach new communities because yeah, we, it's, this is something we can all enjoy. Um, and it's changed my life tremendously. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about myself. And I think if everybody can see my slides, there's a question mark and a bird there. And that's like where it starts here, right? Um, so for me, the first thing I think when we want to think about, you know, what the hell is a bird? What are they doing? Why are they there? Uh, are are they dinosaurs? Are they not dinosaurs? What, really, huh? Um, so uh, birds are, so believe it or not, the, the closest thing that birds are related to uh, are crocodiles. They are both pterosaurs or pteropods, and they are the closest living relatives to dinosaurs. So it goes dinosaurs, uh, and they're the most extinct dinosaurs that still exist at this point in time. Um, so really ancient class of bird uh, organisms, um, and yeah, they've been around for a really long time. Um, to think about this, like, we just want to think about like what a bird is and some features that make, that have evolved over time to consider them uh, what they are. So for me, the first thing I think about are beaks or bills, interchangeable. Most people, most birders will refer to rounded bills rounded features on a bird's face as a bill and sharp birds of prey as beaks, but it's interchangeable, it's the same, don't worry about it. Uh, this is a roseate spoon bill, uh, and it's got a highly evolved bill that's used for uh, uh, wading and foraging through thick, murky salt marsh, looking for invertebrates. So it's evolved this highly unusual bill here. Um, uh, bills, are really, bills and beaks are really important for birds because jaws in general are a lot heavier. So everything about a bird is evolved to allow them to be lightweight and be able to fly. Um, so these are all features that are really important to them. So bills, beaks, way lighter than having a jaw full of teeth and, ho and solid hollow bone. Um, another feature um, are feathers. Feathers are modified scales that birds have and often lead to in cases of this uh, king of Saxony, bird of paradise, found in New Guinea, um, they can lead to crazy ornamentation that happens when sexual selection goes haywire and goes crazy there. Um, so it's a nice feature for them. It also helps with insulation and it helps another lightweight thing that helps them fly. Um, so another crucial thing for these birds here. Um, let me know if I'm talking too fast. I tend to do that and I tend to be a mumbler. So give me a little like, slow down, buddy. Um, so moving on here, uh, this is a wandering albatross. And the other thing about birds is our wings. Um, so this bird has the longest wingspan of all the birds out there. Albatross are in a uh, family of great wanderers. They'll feed their birds. They'll, there's, a, there's colonies in Hawaii. They'll come out to the West Coast. Uh, an Oregon current and feed out here and then go right back to the colony in a single flight. Um, so wings are really important for a bird and they're bipedal nature. So you'll, you won't find birds kind of haunching on their front leg, on their front uh, four wings and uh, walking on all fours. Uh, bipedal nature of the birds, you'll see birds hopping, some birds skulk like starlings and whatnot. Um, so wings, bipedal nature, another kind of important thing. Another thing that I probably haven't mentioned uh, are eggs. All birds lay them, um, and all birds have special adaptations as far as the amount of time it takes to incubate those eggs, 
the amount of time it takes to raise the chicks once the eggs are hatched. But all that happens outside of the bird um, and is incubated that way. These are common mer eggs. Um, common mers are these black and white seabirds. They nest on cliff sides and they nest right next to each other. So on a cliff side right next to each other and they lay one egg. Um, and in a colony that large, it's really, really hard to come back to a nest site, especially if they just nest on bare cliff face to figure out which egg is yours. So this is a photo showing that variation in egg shape, egg, egg uh, color and egg style. So there's some with like these really obvious splotches, some of these like wiry marks on it. And then they, I've worked on colonies where you've had blue eggs and then they, there's colors all the way out to pink and uh, like dark or even white in some cases. Um, also, you can look at the elliptical nature of this egg. So they nest on cliff sides and you know those punching clowns that people have that like kind of bounce around um, and have that shape there? Um, mm -hmm. You can pull that shape and once they get knocked around, they instead of rolling over, they just kind of hold that position and roll back and forth. So it's another adaptation that's evolved um, to make sure that these eggs survive on these like extremely sheer cliff sides here. Um, and we have a question from Michelle going back mm -hmm. to the jaw bill anatomy mm -hmm. and the scales into feathers. What are some of the research you recommend to learn more about these adaptations? Yeah, uh, at the end of this slide, at the end of this presentation, I have a bunch of books that I have really, that really do go deeper in depth. I also hope to be uh, doing another session like this where we get into like taxonomy, evolution, um, look at different clades and how birds have evolved. Um, but for right now, if we want to answer that question, um, two books that are really great. There's Frank, Frank Gill's book called Ornithology, capital all caps. Um, then there's another book called uh, The Manual of Ornithology. And that's kind of like more like a workbook that a lot of universities use for like uh, ornithology classes. Uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which is like the go-to resource for birds. Um, they have a handbook for bird biology and that's a great resource as well as far as getting like a deeper understanding of like how these uh, adaptations have evolved over time. Um, yeah, so let me skip back to things on here. <laughs> So can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so this bird, sorry, you were saying that these long things coming out, those are feathers yeah. that are like, they're just kind of on the head? Or yeah. Down? yeah, there's, let me see, I can escape from this. Uh, so all these birds in the family Paradisiae, they're birds that have evolved in Papua New Guinea um, and in West, uh, Eastern parts of Australia, if that makes sense. I think so. Um, and they've existed in a world where there's very few predators and very few, and, and an unlimited amount of food. Um, so those two, tend, those two things tend to be really uh, important factors for like sexual selection in general. And when you get rid of those things, other things become important. Mm. Um, so in this genetic population, mutations have evolved where females of the population find, you know, that one male over there has got this nice little weird plume. I think I'm going to decide to mate with this one. And in that population, especially slow and isolated, small and isolated, that kind of uh, trait can go, hey, go crazy. Um, so I would spend some time after this, since we all have a ton of time, <laughs> just go online and look up Birds of Paradise. They're absolutely one of my favorite uh, families of birds. They're a great example of what happens when birds get isolated and uh, sexual, sexual selection goes rampant. Um, they have these really rampant uh, displays where they'll show off these random feathers. Um, it's great if you want to sync that up to like a nice like hip hop track and have a little dance party with these birds there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's pretty incredible. It's also uh, another uh, uh, display of what happens uh, with island biogeography. So the thought is that 
that entire family of birds uh, that I was showing you there uh, comes from one single crow ancestor. Um, so they're really closely related to the family Corvidae, uh, which are crows, jays, and magpies. And one bird flew over, landed on his island, a few, a few birds, not one, landed on this island and just kind of colonized this island. So most of the birds on this island are in that family Paradisiae. Uh, cool. And some incredible traits have evolved. Um, they're pretty, pretty incredible birds. Um, so I'm gonna keep on going here. Hopefully everything is back on track here. Yeah, okay. So after feathers, wings, bipedal nature, and eggs, there's something about, so here's a Anna's hummingbird. Um, and this is kind of a representation of birds have a really high metabolic rate. So they turn over food energy into en like metabolic energy really, really fast. Hummingbirds are an extreme example of that. But in order to fly, in general, to getting that initial like input to get up in the air is, is, has a high cost of energy. Um, so to be able, be able to deal with that, they have a really high metabolic rate. Um, oftentimes birds, especially when you're handling them, uh, there's a possibility for them to like kind of pass out or even die because of the stress because they're functioning so high and so efficiently. Their lung capacity turns over oxygen into their blood really, really fast. Um, so these are birds that are, birds in general are operating at a really fast scale. Um, and and uh, yeah, so they have a really high metabolic rate in order to fly again. Again, the thing I want to hone in on here is that flying is mostly key for most species of birds. Um, moving on, there are two point, points of interest here as, as far as uh, bird anatomy that we don't often see because it's on the inside of a bird, uh, do we? Um, that help them fly and help with muscle, muscle attachment and help deal with uh, elevation changes as they fly through uh, different uh, latitudes or el different elevation. Um, right here, if, can you guys see my uh, cursor? So right here is the furculum and it's the wishbone on a bird and it's like runs right here. And then this part here is called the keel. And these are great spots for muscle attachment on the breast. So these points of attachment for muscle are really important to be able to, for birds to like flap those wings and get those wings going. The furculum also helps with uh, keeping the cavity and that the membrane that covers the internal organs uh, intact as birds put the high stress of flying on their bodies. Um, the other thing here that I can show here is birds have hollow bones. Another way to cut out on weight um, and be able to get up in the air a lot easier. So if you look at the human bone here, it's really dense. There's bone marrow right in there. Um, and on bird bone, there's all these random trusses that run across that provide really strong structure, but add, give them the ability to be really light as well. Um, so those two things are really important for uh, birds here. Um, so I think right now I'm gonna, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Mercy, how do I <laughs> turn over so I can, people can see me? Um, so you're in shared screen mode. So if you want to go back to your shared screen button Got at it. the bottom center, and you might um, uh, go back to your, are you still on your PowerPoint? Go back to the uh, Zoom. There you are. I, that was me? There you go. Okay. So <laughs> here's a little, little break from the PowerPoint. Um, just to talk about some equipment you guys might need. So the next thought, so now we know what birds are, kind of, sort of, um, is to think about what you need when you're going out and about. Um, and these are binoculars. Um, I have a pair that I, so I don't really think that people need like the most expensive binoculars. Also, shout out to Mercy. Mercy's got a, a binocular library at Wild Diversity that people can kind of borrow binoculars and use that out for a particular point in time. Is that right, Mercy? Yes. yes, no, and maybe. <laughs> yes, no, maybe. Yeah. Right, we'll I guess not for now, but yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, there's opportunities to kind of borrow those uh, binoculars as well. Um, I have a pair of binoculars that are 10 by 42. Uh, that first number represents the number of magnification you're getting. So it's 10 times what you would be seeing with the naked eye. And then the 42 is the number of the size of the diameter of the lens of the binocular there. So that's 
the bigger the diameter of the lens, the more light that you allow in. So 42 is usually the standard. I have a higher magnification, but so I go by 10 by because I usually work in places where I'm birding in open water or birding mud flats and whatnot. So I want more magnification because I'm dealing with birds at a higher distance. Most people that are birding in your backyards or out in the forest or any of those like common places, they're using eight by 42s and those are perfectly fine. Um, I think that range from either seven to 10, but always 42 being the millimeter lens length is the way to go if you're thinking about binoculars in general. Um, you can find some really good pairs of binoculars for like under or around $150. Um, I like Nikon or Vortex in that price range. Um, they're pretty great and easy to use. And a lot of it has to do basically for me at least is getting used to like how binoculars feel in your hand. It's about the comfort and preference. So if you like your lenses darker or lighter, that's on you. So I'd say get out there and try them out. Not now, but soon. Um, binoculars are another important thing. Um, personal preference is key. Um, and then the other thing I would say is a notebook. I always carry a notebook with me. Um, helps me keep track of what I'm seeing. I also sometimes draw sketches or take notes as far as what I'm seeing out and about. Um, and then the biggest thing are field guides. Um, I was born and raised a Sibley's boy. Um, so Peter's uh, Sibley's guides to birds. Um, let me see if I can grab it, I'll be right back. Here we go. This is the standard folks. Um, and this is what I use most of the time. There is a Sibley's Guide to the West. It's a little bit limited. So it's everything west of the Rockies. Um, and it's got kind of the best information out there. Really good plates, wide pages so you can compare similar species at the same time when you're out and about. Um, I think it's a great resource. Another great book that is coming up in the game and people are talking about, chit-chatting about, um, it's National Geographic's 7th uh, edition and only the 7th edition. Um, and they have regional West East Coast uh, books and they're pretty great because they have tabs on them. So if you need to quickly go to a bird that looks like a gull, you can go to gulls. If you quickly need to go to a bird of prey, you can go to that section as well. I love their illustrations a little bit more. Um, there's a little bit more detail. Sometimes Sibley gets the color off, um, but a lot of these guides are just used as kind of the standard look of what that bird is. There's tons of variation in plumage and in individuals, um, but these are kind of good ways to hold true to what the, what a, the prototypical species would look like. Um, and we have a couple more questions and, uh, and Jay, Michelle, you can let me know if they have already been answered. But going back to the binoculars, if they nearsighted or wear glasses, doesn't make a difference on what binoculars to use. And the second question is, could you share tips on using binocs? Um, examples like use both eyes, for example, hold up to your face. Yeah. Touch it to your skin adjustments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have glasses. You can all see that. These are glasses. And I keep my lens caps down when I'm doing that. Um, so a lot of the, I, I forget the detail around it, but it's the measurement from the eyepiece to your eye is something that you can also consider. Someone should look that up at some point. But when you're braiding with glasses, I, uh, caps down. And then if you don't have glasses, you'll pull your caps up. Um, that's a simple move. You just want to keep the amount of light uh, coming from the side angles at a minimum. So having, those, having them as close to your eyes as possible is the best bet. Uh, I think the other question was like looking at for tips while using it in the field. Is that right, right Mercy? The other question is, yeah, use, how do you use and make adjustments to binoculars? How do you yeah. have to see your face? So there's a thing, okay, I, I was not gonna go over it because it's a little like, um, yeah. Or I could reframe the question because yeah. I yeah. asked it. Thank you. Because I realized part of this is like, if we were actually in person, it, we, would, we would be able to yeah, totally. use it. But um, sometimes when I've tried them previously, I don't know, like, do I actually touch it to like 
you know, this part of my skin, yeah. maybe it's a personal preference or I get a little bit blurry or almost dizzy to be like, what, how do I focus my eyes to yeah. use them the best way? Yeah. So I, that makes so sense. personal preference is like a pretty important thing. Um, just trying to figure out what, how it sits on your eyes is important. I think, again, keeping the light out from the side will help tremendously. There is a thing, and I don't know how this is going to translate via this conference call, but on binoculars, if you guys can see this, can you see it? There is a bit of a dial here on the left side, and that is called your diopter, um, and it helps kind of focus the binoculars towards your, your eyes. And oftentimes when I take people birding, we'll adjust that as soon as we get out in the field. And a quick way to do that, and let me know if, this, if I'm getting too far in the weeds here. Um, so it's, it's adjusted for your right eye. So what you would immediately do is put your, put your binoculars to your eyes, you cover your right eye, and you move the dial in the middle to get it focused in your left eye. And then you switch and cover your left eye, and you use that diopter dial to keep it in focus on your right eye. And then for that point on, it should be adjusted towards your eyes and you'll keep on using the dial to focus in and out for birds at different distances. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Um, and that's like kind of the biggest thing. I think when birding in general, I hardly ever, I mean, I put my binoculars to my eyes, but a lot of the time I'm spending with my binoculars at my chest, kind of looking around and trying to spot birds um, as opposed to keeping them up. Um, kind of always scanning for birds. Um, a lot of times I'll like watch a bird's behavior in a tree and kind of scan around and see what it's doing and then kind of take note where it is. Never taking my eyes off the bird, but take pulling my binoculars up to my eyes. It's a thing when I started birding that I would always happen. It's like, and people say it all the time when they're birding, as soon as you put your eyes, to take your eye off the bird or go to like grab a scope or anything, the bird's gonna be gone. Um, so just kind of making sure while you're out there, you're, yeah, taking your time to like see where the bird's doing, getting a sense of behavior, getting an idea of whether or not that bird's going to like kind of take off or not. Um, there's some things you can kind of key on. Um, so yeah, that's binocular talk for you, for everybody. I think there's a, two more things I wanted to mention outside of the books um, or mobile apps. Uh, they're getting pretty good. When they first started out a few years ago, they were awful, um, but now they're catching up. So on my phone, when I go out, I have Sibley's e-guide, and that is the same thing that's on the book. It has audio on it, which is really nice, so you can kind of get a sense of bird song. Um, that costs money, so that's, I think it's like $15 for the app, but it's the whole book. You can uh, make it pretty localized towards where you are in the, in the country. And then the other one that's really, really, really great now is, um, uh, blah, 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 is, Mer is uh, Mer the Merlin app. Um, and that's done by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And that app is incredible. So um, if you link that, this is something we'll talk, into, talk about later when you talk about online resources. But if you link that to your eBird account, it'll show you birds you've already seen. And on this app, you can make highly uh, localized lists. So you can get down to Portland, you can get down to what to expect within this time frame. So I have my list for like March right now, and you can list the birds by freq uh, frequency of, uh, of occurrence. So you can, have, you can have your section of ducks and it'll be ranked by the most common duck down to the least common duck. Um, which I think happens to a lot of birders in general is that you want to jump to the most rare thing and usually it's the most common. Um, so Merlin app is, I think if you're getting started is probably the best thing to have in your, on your phone um, and a great way to kind of get acquainted with bird song. They have great photos from Cornell's uh, uh, lab. Um, really great app, can't talk about it enough. Um, I can, cause I'm moving on. Um, so yeah. I'm gonna get into, I'm gonna share my screen again here. And then I'm gonna get into uh, what to do when you have a bird in front of you, how to start. Um, how's everybody doing? Good? Yep, great. <laughs> uh, all right. Doing great. So 
Uh, I just wanted to talk about a few things. So, on the planet, there are 10,000 plus bird species. And then in the United States, we have around 850 birds that can be observed. It's a lot. Um, and uh, I think the biggest thing for me starting out was trying to figure out how to group birds. Um, there's a taxonomic order of that. So you have like families and those kind of groups there, but there's also like, this is a bird that is on the water. That's a group of birds, right? Um, this is a bird that I often see in a tree. That's a group of birds as well. That group of birds perching, they're called passerines. You already got it figured out. Um, and if you see a fowl on the water, it's a waterfowl. That's a group of birds. It's an added day. Um, so those common groups will help you kind of key out what you're seeing in front of you. And I think it's a pretty important way to kind of get acquainted with how birds are organized uh, taxonom taxonomically and also how birds kind of figure themselves out uh, as far as niche partitioning or how they figure out where they, go where they exist and what habitats they occupy. Um, so, um, there's a few things when I go out birding that I will start doing. There's a few things when you can get to an open. So when I get to an open area, I do a thing called scanning. Um, so if I'm working a mud flat or working a large water body, I'll kind of scan back and forth to see what's, see birds I haven't already identified or seen on the area. And that helps a lot getting birds, especially at a distance. Um, and then spotting is you're, you're seeing different, you're seeing movement in a tree. Um, and then that's the thing I was talking about earlier. It's like, it's most important to kind of just stay with the bird and kind of figure out where it's headed, kind of guess in that regard, but kind of get an idea what, what's the bird's, where the bird is and figure out what a good spot is to finally bring your, the last thing you should be doing is bringing your, your binoculars to your eyes, I think. Um, so, so important things that can elucidate kind of get to the bottom of what family or group these birds are in um, is shape. So right here, this is a Buick's wren. Uh, it's in the family Trolodidae. I think I'm saying that right, but I'm probably saying it wrong. Um, and they, I always imagine them as like little puff balls with their tails kind of perched up. You can kind of see that in that photo there. Um, and that's a great key to that family, the family of wrens. They all kind of do that thing. Uh, so that's an important thing to consider is like shape when it comes to a bird and how their body plane looks and uh, kind of sets up on, while they're perching and how they, how they like position themselves, what's their posture um, are all important things to keep in mind when trying to ID a bird. Uh, I think another thing that's really hard to identify and I have this ruby cow and kinglet, which is one of the smallest passerines in North America right here um, is size and size is a hard thing to, kind of adjust for at a distance, but I always compare size to an object that's nearby or known birds. So I often, when people are like, hey, I saw this bird that's this and that, I first question I'll ask is, is it bigger than a robin or smaller than a robin? That's like a known bird that we all have a pretty good grasp on what that size is. Um, or I'll say, is it bigger than a crow or smaller than a crow? These are all things to kind of have a point of reference that we can all communicate with uh, and keep an idea on. So that's uh, uh, size, yes. And then uh, behavior. Um, I have a olive-sided flycatcher right here. Um, and they're part of a family called Tyranidae. They're the flycatchers or the tyrant flycatchers. And they have a pretty unique fly, uh, behavior. They flycatch. So you'll often see them perched in the most conspicuous branches up high like this photo shows. And they'll, they'll do this thing that people call sallying or, or fly catching where they'll come out off the branch and fly back to the branch, picking off insects off the air. So they catch all their food off the air. So that's a great thing to consider when you're consider, like thinking about what the bird did. Literally this bird is catching flies in the air. It's fly catching, it's a fly catcher. Um, so the kind of keeping that behavior in mind is pretty important uh, as you go out in the field. Um, habitat is another thing. I have this American bed in here. Um, birds can fly, so they often can be seen outside of their expected habitat, but almost 90% of the time, if you're in the habitat for that bird, um, that's where the bird will be in the habitat that it should probably be in. Um, there's aberrant behavior that you'll see in birds that drive birders crazy. You'll get birders driving 
10 miles, 20 miles, 100 miles to go see a bird that's completely lost. But most often not, birds like American bittern will be in a kind of marshy habitat, working the edge, looking for uh, tiny minnows and other fishes. Um, and the other thing here is looking at kind of field marks. Um, I have a lesser goldfinch over here and big field marks on this bird that help you identify it as comparison to other bird like the American goldfinch that's a closely related bird are these like this black crown here. There's this thing called wing bars that's extended right here. And that is something that people will often say, especially birders as we communicate. Uh, we'll say it had pretty big, broad, obvious white wing bars. That'll help you eliminate a lot of things. And a lot of these birds that are in here as on the slide, like the ruby crowned, this, West, this um, Western tanager has wing bars here and stuff on its, uh, and fe yellow feathers on its upper coverts there. So these are all important things to kind of get familiar with bird topography. I'll have a slide showing a little bit of that in a little bit. Um, but being able to have, getting into the vocabulary of what bird is used and how to describe a bird to another person who might know that bird is pretty important. Um, yeah, uh, seasonality is another thing that's really important. So birds migrate um, and you wouldn't expect to see a Western tanager uh, in, in Portland in the middle of the winter, um, it'd be a crazy sighting, um, but you'd expect them to see them in spring. So like knowing what birds are here, what those rhythms are, are pretty important to kind of get that list of birds smaller and smaller. Um, so that's like something that's really important. It's just to like eliminate all this extraneous things that like will kind of distract you from what you're trying to identify here. Um, and the last thing, this is, the last thing that I, like when I started maybe the first like five, ten, five years, 10 years of birding, I like did not care about this at all is voice. Um, sometimes it's important and it, it is important. I will not eliminate that, but it's hard to like get that while you're also trying to do everything else. So for the like first few years of birding, I just like, I knew some birds, but like kind of didn't worry about voice until I got to handle everything else. Um, but it's important. So American bitterns have this weird call. I'm going to try it. It's going to be like this, like, maybe I can play it. I will play it later. But it's got this glunk glunk sound. It's like this car keys dropping in a big puddle of water sound. And that is a weird sound for a bird to make. Um, so if you hear any extremes on that voice side, that's something to take note of. That will help you kind of ID the bird. But if you hear a house finch call that sounds like kind of 10,000 different calls, it's not really gonna help you at that moment, uh, especially when you're starting out. Um, so those are some things that I would consider, um, especially when going out birding, it's those, those kind of seven things there. Um, and then another thing is move like, move like at a glacial pace when you're out in the field, move so slow. People often talk about birders like moving at a birder's pace. I went birding like a couple of days ago and it took me an hour and a half to walk a mile. Um, and it's just like moving so slow, being mindful, kind of taking in all your surroundings um, and getting really like slowing down, I think is the biggest thing. Uh, you'll often hear birds like alarm calling and you're not gonna get that if you're kind of pushing through an area. Um, so. Yeah, just keeping that mind, slowing down, um, following sounds is another important thing. Like oftentimes you'll hear alarm calls or you'll hear like jays calling with a fly over, but they're calling for some other reason. And oftentimes that reason is this, there's a predator. So I, when I first started birding, I found all my owls initially by just following crows. Shout out to crows. Um, they like would lead me, they often mob birds of prey whenever they're in that area. There's a eagle here. This is a, I think a really popular meme for a really long time. Um, chasing a barn owl over here. Gulls will often do it as well. And these birds will alert you of like big birds of prey uh, in their area. I found, I found, I've been, there's a barred owl at Fern Hill Park that I found just because crows were going nuts. Um, they'll often hang above the bird and dive at the bird swiping back and forth. So kind of keying in on that behavior, being aware of that kind of behavior uh, is pretty important to be able to find these like kind
kind of cool birds of prey that you don't often get to see. That's mm -hmm. one of my favorite things is to watch crows uh, attack owls. Yeah. I mean, eagles and other birds of prey. It's really yeah. fascinating because they're relentless and it like never ends. They'll follow them forever, it seems like. They won't give up, yeah, yeah. Michelle, I think you had a question? Yeah, I had a question. So this is my sort of nerd out section since I'm interested in the birds of prey. Um, yeah. So it could be like a protective strategy. Is it that because the birds of prey could potentially eat the eggs or the young of the other birds or what's like, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. I think the biggest thing, so I worked on, uh, I worked on a seabird colony in the mouth of uh, the Columbia River at East Sand Island. Um, and it's the largest colony of Caspian terns, and they do the same behavior. Um, when a bird, when a colony of birds or a group of birds like crows sees a bird of prey, they'll all get up. So on a colony of Caspian terns, it's pretty incredible. A colony of 10,000 birds will flush up in the air. So their immediate response to this predator that could potentially eat them, uh, predate on them, is to get up higher than the actual bird of prey to keep above it. That helps a lot of birds of prey like to come down on their prey and it kind of makes it impossible to do that. The second thing is making everybody, all your, uh, your cohorts that are also breeding with you, know that there's a bird of prey in the area. Um, just to like, hey, get on attention. There's something dangerous above us. And the third thing they'll do is they'll often just chase that bird of prey until it's out of the area. So gulls are really great at it. They'll go after a gull, uh, after eagles across the island. Caspian terns will dive bomb them. Um, they'll often defecate on the bird of prey. Oftentimes that's thought to like kind of loot. There's thoughts about uh, the acidic nature of bird guano kind of degrading the like that waxy sheen on a bird's feathers to like, yeah, it's a lot to that, but that's a thought that people have. I don't know how much credence I'm letting to that, but um, yeah, it's a defense mechanism. It's a prey. It's a prey response to get above these birds of prey and chase them out of the area. Um, so, hope that answers the question there. Any other questions while I move on to maybe the next area? Nope, we're good. Cool. All right. Um, okay. So here's a picture of a forest edge, and it means nothing to most people, but it means a lot to me. Um, so this is a section where I'm kind of talking about like what, when you have those basics down, what other things to kind of key in on to make sure when you go out, you get kind of get the best out of it. When I first started birding, I would go to like these areas that were just like monolith, like homogenous like habitat. So I'd think like, oh, go to the forest. Birds are in the forest. Um, and I would just come out with like four or five species of birds. Um, and what you find is that forest edges or places that have a lot of diversity in habitat tend to lend themselves to your ability to see those birds. Forest edges are particularly important because um, especially work, working a path, birds have to fly from one area to the other area. So by that, just that fact that they have to move across it, they expose themselves a little bit more often. Um, so having that working for you will allow you to see more birds. Diversity in habitat will lead to diversity in birds. Uh, kind of goes hands in hand there. Um, so I'll often pick areas that have water, have like a kind of shrubland, looking for grassland is perfect. So you'll, all those mixes of habitats will add to the, amount, the different types of birds you'll see in those areas. Um, yeah, often think about like, for me, I have these like practice areas and birders call it a patch. Um, right now we might call it your backyard. Um, but it's a place to like, you keep on going back to. And I can't stress this enough. When I was a, a young birder, I went to a place called Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge almost every weekend. And I just got familiar with the habitat, got familiar with the plants there, got familiar with like how the seasons change in those areas. Um, and it helps so much to get an idea of what's going on in that really small area that you can kind of apply it elsewhere. Um, and it helped me tremendously, especially like seeing the same birds over and over again. Birds during the breeding season will hold the same territory. So I knew when I walked past this one patch, I would see the song sparrow every, every time because the male would pop up and defend or sing, his, sing at its territory. Um, 
So having these like places you go, get used to, kind of eliminates all the other stress or whatever that comes in with starting a new habit, uh, hobby. Um, yeah, those are all really important things for me when I first started going. Um, another thing that helps me is like looking at, and this is like kind of, yeah, keeping a list of birds, eBird is another thing that I'll talk about in a little bit, but keeping a list is so important as far as like tracking what you've seen, tracking what you're like you might see, especially if you keep a list over time, um, you'll get an idea of what's going to appear there at certain times of the year, or you can go like, you can have observations like this. Oh, this Western tanager is here a little earlier than usual. Like that's a curious thing and it keeps on getting you going. Um, so taking lists, people don't like listing. Some people just like to go outside and like take it in all, take it all in. Great. Um, either way works. But for me, at least it was nice to have like this thing that I could kind of follow throughout my year. Um, yeah. I think that's edge effects. That's all those things I wanted to talk about. Let's see what the next slide is here. Yeah, so this is bird topography. Um, this is a little, little in the weeds here, but I think people might be interested in this. Um, so I'm gonna go over like some things that are really, that you'll often see in like bird guides or things that you'll often see like uh, birders talk about. Um, so this section here, the breast uh, and throat is often a thing people talk about. It's like, there's a sparrow called a white-throated sparrow. It'll have white on this section right there. Um, that's an important thing to consider. Uh, the nape is another thing that birds often have uh, coloration or different patterns on, and that's right on the back of the neck there. Um, tail feathers, dark-eyed juncos, when they fly, they have two white tertial uh, tail feathers, and it's these end feathers right there. Uh, and that's another important thing to kind of consider uh, when you're out and about. Uh, the rump patch, which is this here on a bird, or that there on a bird, is another thing that often will have either white or yellow or some sort of coloration. And that's another thing to kind of consider when you're out in the field and thinking about those kind of things. Uh, on the face of a bird, um, the beak, obviously, beak or bill, uh, but there's a thing called a supercilium which is this line right here above the eye. And on a lot of sparrows and on a lot of birds, there's some sort of marking that runs across it or runs right through the eye, which is the eye stripe there. Those are both kind of important things to look for. Um, on a lot of sparrows, this part right here that I'm running over is called the crown stripe or the lateral stripe. And that's another part portion of a bird that will often have some sort of coloration. Like on the ruby, on the ruby crown kinglet, there's that crown that runs on the crown there. Um, that's, that's another important spot, spot. Eye rings, oftentimes birds will have an, a ring around the eye and some sort of color, coloration. In some warbler species, literally identifying them is whether or not the eye ring is broken or not. Um, so that's an important thing. So birds will often have a white eye ring, an obvious eye ring, or some sort of color, coloration around that uh, eye to like let you, give you some clues as to what it is, especially once you start getting into like, families like uh, flycatchers or sparrows where there's like, like there's people describe like the yellow wash on the lures will distinguish savannah sparrows versus the other sparrow. And you're just like, what are we talking about? Um, so those things are kind of cool things to kind of key in on and uh, keep an eye out when you're out in the field. Um, cool. Uh, I wanted to give you folks some 13 species that I kind of, uh, looked up on eBird to like that have the highest frequency um, and birds that will like these are 13 birds I have like 15 because I, I can't help myself obviously I uh, have a lot to say um, but these are birds that like I have like nailed down I think most of us might already but I have nailed down so like when I get out in the field I don't even need to bring my binoculars to my eyes I go that's a song sparrow I know that call I'm moving on I want no, I don't want but I'm out to get something different today, you know? And these birds you will often see on every time, every time you go out in the field. I, all my list this year have an American crow on it. Um, so that's a species that kind of get down. I think we all kind of have crows down in our back pockets. Um, yeah, another one is a song sparrow. Um, kind of notice this like brown striping down the side here and gray around that supercilium and right underneath. Again, there's that 
eye stripe moving through and across the eye there. It's another important thing to consider. These birds will often see in backyards. They have these three, at some point you should look up all the calls, but they have these three introductory notes that are always the same. And that's kind of a way to kind of distinguish them from other sparrows. Uh, they've got a lot of songs. They often will like have different songs for different things. So like, hey, there's another male, like a couple of blocks away. I can hear him. I'm gonna put on the show, put on the Ritz and give him my best song. So they have songs that are a little bit more complicated. Um, this is a species oftentimes in the like late summer, it's fall, you'll often hear young birds, especially birds of the year that just hatched, trying out the song because it's a learned thing. And it'll throw birders off like so much because you're just like, it sounds like a song sparrow, but it sounds bad. And oftentimes it's an immature bird kind of figuring it out. Um, so another bird to get in, get in your like, get in your head and have it, have it down um, just to kind of eliminate all the noise. Everybody knows what this is, I hope. Not hope, you should, maybe you shouldn't. Um, it's an American robin, um, kind of the quintessential bird um, of like spring, moving through the here year round. Um, and yeah, you'll often hear them calling, eating on fruits, uh, gathering in large groups. Um, yeah, call them, actually call the robin, which is technically not what it's supposed to be called, uh, New World birds that are called robins are supposed to be called thrushes and old world birds are called robins. So there's a European robin that looks pretty similar. When settlers came to America, they were like, that looks like that bird, we'll call it an American robin. Um, but it actually is a thrush. It's in a different, completely different family than those old world birds. Um, another bird to get down. Dark-eyed juncos, one of my faves. Um, they have a crazy call that doesn't sound like a sparrow at all really. Um, and again, you can see those white tail feathers at the end of that line there near the rump. That's like on all these birds, you'll get that kind of white stripes there. And that's kind of a key, especially when they're in flight um, and you flush a group of them. That's a good one to go like, oh, white stripes, probably most likely uh, a uh, dark eyed junco. Uh, there's a lot of variation in the species across North America. Um, and they'll have different plumages. So this is the Oregon race here. It's got a black head, kind of a pinkish bell, pink wash on the flanks here, going up to the breast. Um, cool, cool bird, oftentimes uh, was often called the Oregon junco is the name of the, the, that subspecies, that, that race of birds here. Um, pretty good bird to get familiar with if you're birding in uh, Portland. Um, here it is, chickadee, 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 dee, dee. Um, uh, black capped chickadee is another species that you'll find across North America. Um, they're cavity nesters. They're kind of the birds that come to feeders pretty often, taking one seed and bouncing out um, because they have to like open up with their bill and they have a harder time doing that than other birds. So they kind of take off from the feeder instead of staying at the feeder, eating seed after seed after seed. Um, another species that we have in Portland that looks superficially the same, but looks a little different is a chestnut back chickadee. And you'll see that chestnut wash on the back there. And then that chestnut wash on the sides, flanks there. Um, calls are a little bit different, but I think as you're going through it, you can kind of notice the difference, but I don't think if you're, if you're just new to it, you're not gonna pick that up. Um, I think just like, you often see them mix flocks together. So yeah, but considering that wash, uh, I think they just kind of a smaller profile, but maybe that's not true. Um, yeah, um, this is another one. Uh, I'm sure you, you might be hearing this against your your siding or against your uh, your uh, rain drains or whatever those called um, your gutters. Um, it's a northern flicker. Um, there's two races in North America. There's uh, the red shafted that we have on the west coast and the uh, yellow shafted that I have pictured on the right here. Um, and then there's some intermediates as you get towards the Rockies or even Eastern Oregon. Um, these birds are woodpeckers in the same family. They have this, I kind of call it, you'll hear in your backyard often, it's just like this kia, kia um, call that you'll hear pretty often. Um, and right now they are going crazy. They're drumming on everything, advertising the females uh, and uh, making their, becoming really apparent to everybody. Sorry about that. Um, Northern flickers. Uh, another one 
This is another sparrow species and it related to the song sparrow. It's called a spotted toey. Uh, this is another one you'll often see in your backyard. They're kind of a little secretive. Um, you'll see them on the ground kind of picking up leaves, tossing them about, uh, looking for vegetation, looking for insects there. They have this kind of call that uh, Candace will often refer to as this like Larry call um, and that kind of gives them away. Um, and they have that really nice uh, red iris there. Um, so another bird that you'll see in your backyard pretty often. Uh, here is this one. This is a hummingbird that's here year round. Um, this is the Anna's hummingbird. Um, this is a species that didn't, 10 years ago, didn't occur in Oregon year round. Uh, and now through a number of range expansion uh, variables has made it all the way up to Alaska. Um, and yeah, they uh, frequent feeders pretty often. You'll often see these guys year round. There's another hummingbird called the Rufus hummingbird um, that you'll find in Portland uh, as spring hits, but they're a little less common. And it's another one. Everyone should know this one. This is a European starling. Uh, they've got, they're in an old world family of, uh, called Sternidae. They were introduced to North America. I can't remember when, but a long time ago, uh, through a couple of introductions in New York City, and that was it. Um, and then they expanded throughout most of the United States and North America. Um, we often see these folks, these folks, these birds in large flocks, uh, and they're making like a raucous, going crazy. Um, big obvious clue for these for these birds is that iridescent wash that is like iconic of them, and then that bright yellow bill that's true to the birds in the breeding plumage. Um, so. Yeah, European starning. Sternus vulgaris is its genus name, and they are vulgar, vulgar in a lot of ways. Um, formerly the Western scrub jay, but now the California scrub jay. Um, this is another uh, crow species that you'll find in this area. Um, and yeah, it's a bird that you'll often see uh, in your backyards, kind of going crazy, uh, chasing. I've often seen them following squirrels as they catch their food and go after the cash that they just deposited. Um, so pretty smart, very intelligent birds. Um, they're in that crow family, the smarties of the world. Um, this is another one, uh, this is the house finch. Uh, these guys you'll see often, this is the bird oftentimes people will say, I can't believe this bird, it looked like this, it had this and that. There's a lot of features on this bird. Uh, they have variation in their plumage, so you'll see them in yellow or this like kind of purplish hue. Um, and they occupy a lot of your backyards, um, and there's a lot of variability in them. Uh, they're hard species to kind of nail down, but looking at that thick bell there and noticing that washed, how it stops kind of at the breast there, is pretty important to keep in consider, especially because there's another species that looks pretty similar called the purple finch that, in my estimation, I can see a bird with a, a sharper bill, beak, um, and then more purple on its body than the house finch there. Um, those are the nuances that you'll get as you keep on practicing, but it's just another species to be aware of that you can confuse that bird for. Uh, but it looks look like it's been washed with like Kool-Aid or something. Yeah, yeah, like some sort of high quality Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> um, coming in hot here, we got the mallard. Everyone knows this dude. Um, fun fact about a mallard. That quack quack that we always hear, you know who makes it? The female. Boom, boom, boom. There it is. Um, so moving past that one, that should be an easy ID for most people. Um, in Oregon, we've got two of these folks here. We have the Canada goose here. And then oftentimes in winter, they become a little bit more uh, less available or uh, less frequent uh, is the cackling goose, which is this really uh, diminutive size Canada replicate. A bit of a mini me here. Um, so they look superficially the same. The calls are a bit different. The Canada goose has a honk and then the cackling goose has got this like kind of laughy <laughs> call. Um, not quite like that because I couldn't, I can't do calls. Um, but two species to kind of be aware of while you're out birding there. Um, and these are my miscellanies. I couldn't stop. I can't stop. I won't stop. Um, uh, Stellar's jays. You'll see in parks around Portland, especially Forest Park, um, sometimes in your backyard, if you have like a lot of uh, softwoods in your backyard, 
Um, another species to kind of be aware of. Uh, great looking. When I came out to the West Coast, that was the bird. It was like, what? Howard, do you have a crest and you got blue there? And it's like a midnight blue? What's your deal? Um, bush tit is another species. You often see these, like, we'll often say, like, you never just see one bush tit. You'll see, like, 15 to 20 is usually the estimate I give. Um, you'll see them in large flocks. They kind of move in like this like uh, school of fish kind of manner. Um, you'll often see them at feeders. This bird with the light iris here is a female. The males have this all dark iris. So you can, there's sexual dimorphism in that species and it's just that eye basically. Um, another species I referred to earlier is the Buick's wren. Um, this is the West Coast counterpart of the Carolina wren on the East Coast. Um, and you can see that broad supercilium right above the eye. And they have a great call. They'll often be aware of you before you are aware of them. So that's one of the birds that you'll, will give you clues to their, their location um, pretty early on before you even spot them. Uh, good bird to have in your back pocket there. Um, and then lastly, the ruby crown king that I showed you earlier with the ruby crown on top. Um, look at that iring that's broken up, see, key to identifying, and that wing bar. Um, really small bird, one of the smallest passerines in North America. Um, and they're kind of a bird that does this fly catching thing, but they're never in the same spot. So they're one of the birds that I, I wouldn't say hate, hate's a hard word, but I have, there's some annoyance with them because they'll always get me to look at them because there's so much movement going on. Um, and it's always the same bird that I was just an IDing. Um, so they're always, that's kind of part of their behavior is to be like over here, over there, over there, because they have a high metabolic rate and they need to keep on eating. Um, so those are my like, those are my maybe 15, was that 15, 16, maybe 17 uh, birds that you kind of, that are, I would think are like, good birds to have in your, in your back pocket, good birds to kind of study up on and definitely birds you would, you might see in your backyard. Um, yeah, I, I have a, I have a backyard list right now going. And I think I'm around like 33 birds. Um, so not bad for right now. Uh, but yeah, keeping that, keeping that list going, especially for your backyards. And you have, we have tons of time right now to do that kind of thing. Uh, pretty cool thing to keep up on. Um, let's see where I'm at now. Okay. I think I'm almost wrapping up. How's everybody doing? Good? Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, let's see where we're at here. Okay. So, um, we're, we're all home now, we're stuck at home. So there's a few things that I love to do. Uh, reading is one of them. And these are like 10 books that I have in my house right now that I really love and couldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give them up, I would say that. I would not give them up. So it's uh, Cornell's Lab of, Cornell Lab of Ornithology's Handbook of Bird Biology. It's really, it's a textbook, um, but there's a lot of information, especially if you're just like, what? is the deal with different incubation times for birds. What's that all about? You can find out in that book there. Um, this book here, the 500 most important bird areas, when we get out and about and be able to travel, hopefully, um, this book is great, especially if you're going to a new state to find places to go birding. That's like one of the hardest things to, not one of the, it's a hard thing to find out, um, but having this resource there, where you can kind of read up, know what's, what to expect there, kind of highlight species for each area. Incredible book for me whenever I go somewhere else. Um, and so that's a great book to have if you're traveling around. Manual of Ornithology, this is like Proctor and Lynch is the, they're OGs of the ornithology game. Um, and yeah, this book is like what most ornithology textbooks will go with. Um, there's Frank Gill's book that I mentioned. That book's got a barn owl on it. It's all black and it costs like a million dollars. Uh, this book is a lot less expensive and has some of the same information. Lots of uh, anatomy, lots of, they get into uh, evolution structure of these of uh, birds and uh, yeah, great book for detail. Uh, Pete Dunn's book, Hawks in Flight, great, great book. Um, especially hawks in general when you're IDing them, they're at a distance and you're looking for like a few clues like there's white on the end of the wing and there was white underneath its rump. That's like all you're going to get from a bird at like a few miles away. So a few miles away, at a distance away. Um, so yeah, those are, that's another good book for people. Uh, some of the books that are a little more like, here's uh, what's the life of birds here. Um, 
Sea Seabirds Cry is a book I love. I'm a seabird biologist, and it's a great approach to like kind of understanding the, that group of birds in general, what makes them pick, why do they need to nest on islands, why are they seabirds, why do they have webbed feet, why do they do this thing where they sky point when they meet each other, what's that all about? Great book on uh, seabird behavior. Um, the Feather Thief is another book that I've like recently read that was pretty great. It's not about birds explicitly, but it's about uh, uh, fly fishing and these guys who stole some specimens from a natural history museum in England to sell rare feathers for fly fishermen. Um, kind of a intercross of like, uh, like one of those like uh, murder mystery podcasts about birds and uh, nerdy stuff. So um, hobbies crossing with other hobbies. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Another book I will mention before I get going here is The Sibley's Guide to Bird Life and Behavior. That's a quick digestible book to have on hand uh, when you're like, why did that bird make that weird sound? Or what were they doing over there where that one bird fed another bird and uh, a worm? What's that about? Um, Sibley's Guide to Bird Behavior will be able to help with that. Um, so those are my 10 that I have that I wouldn't get rid of um, for, yeah, I'd, I'd sell them if you offered to write them out. Um, and then some online resources here. I'm gonna escape here. Um, eBird is my favorite thing. Um, you can, anybody, can everybody see this here? Yeah, cool. Uh, so eBird's great. You can explore hotspots in your area. So if I type in Oregon, boop, 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 beep. Yeah. Ooh, slow internet. Yeah, boop. You can get all this information of birders that have been birding in your area. So John Bishop went out today and saw a red, Northern saw wet owl, like pretty cool stuff. Um, you'll get maps of where to go birding and local hotspots in your area. If you're like, I want to see a, a Northern flicker, you can type in a species here and, or let's, what's a hawk cuckoo like? All birds around the world here that you can look up and kind of get an idea of where they are. So they have photos and then they have range maps at the bottom here where you can find it. It's a bird that you can find in Korea and Japan, apparently. So great resource for me when I get bored and I'm like wanting to brush up on my birds, they have these photo quizzes down here. Um, so you can kind of adjust the quiz for where you are and, um, and what time of year. Um, can't do that because I'm not locked in. But great resource for people. It's a great place to start your own profile. You can start your own profile and have, they'll comp compile like all the birds you've seen in the area and all the birds you've seen over your lifetime. Great resource to have, great way to catalog birds if that's something you want to do. Don't have to do it, not necessary. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to show you is, uh, especially right now, uh, is Cornell, And Cornell lab, live cams are the are some of my favorite, especially if I was studying or reading. It's nice to have this stuff in the background. Uh, they have all these live cams from all around the world. Um, are, are you still sharing your screen with us? Am I not? No. No. Yeah. We're looking no. at your beautiful face. Oh, hey everybody. <laughs> uh, let's see. Where did where did that where did everything go? Okay, here we go. Share. Okay. Back on? Everybody see this? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then if I want to look at Northern Royal Al Al Albatross in New Zealand. Live footage. That's a chick sleeping at its nest right now. Um, this is a great resource for me, at least. So you get to like, especially if you can't be there, you can travel, see these birds and get like really cool ideas about like what their biology is. Um, and stuff you wouldn't necessarily see if while birding. Um, they have a ton of cams. They have feeder cams. So they have all these cameras set up on the East Coast and some on the West Coast. So you can just watch a bird feeder for like a couple hours and study that way. Um, that's a great resource for me sometimes when I'm like birding to a different area. I'll go there and kind of get an idea of what to, what's showing up there, especially this time of year. Great time, great space to like 
waste some time or learn some things. Um, I love it. Um, and let's see, what do I have? That's all I got. Shout out to Portland Audubon. Shout out to Wild Diversity. Um, yeah, really appreciate this ability to like reach out with you folks. Thanks for being here um, and listening to me blabber. Um, yeah, I think if Mercy's okay and with time or whatever, if anybody has any questions, I can attempt to answer those, but yeah. Yeah, let's go to some questions. Thank you so much, Craig. This is really interesting. I feel like I'm learning a lot constantly yeah. from you. Um, so yeah, let's go to a couple of questions. If anyone has any. Where's... Well, I have a question um, while everybody's thinking of theirs. So what if we wanted to like have more birds in our yard? Ooh, so yes. I have a little bit of trees uh, like situation. I have one big tree and kind of just like grass, a little garden we're getting started. Like, do you recommend making bird houses, bird feeders, hummingbird feeders? Mm -hmm. What can we do to lure them in for our cats? Just joking, not our cats. <laughs> oh man, uh, <laughs> that, I almost went on a rant right there. Uh, <laughs> but oh you know, yeah, the biggest thing uh, I think in this, is yeah the biggest thing is putting out water um putting out a shallow bowl or having a bird bath will get you the largest diversity of birds so putting out a feeder will only get if you put out a seed feeder you'll only get seed eating birds if you put out a hummingbird feeder you'll only get hummingbirds right but if you put out water every single bird will come to that feeder fruit eaters will come to it seed eaters hummingbirds um ways you can make that a little bit more attractive or adding motion to that water so if you can like add a little like even if it's like something that just drops water into it every once in a while that'll get birds attention um having feeders is a great way so uh to do that if you're not feeling the water thing but having a feeder is another thing i would say most seed eaters eat black oil sunflower seed in or out of the shell and that's probably all you should be getting especially if you're feeding seed because everybody eats it um and then the other thing you can do is put out suet feeders. Uh, suet is uh, animal fat and worms or seed, depending on the mix. And that'll attract woodpeckers and insect eaters to your feeder, to your house or area, wherever you are. Uh, again, a note on like distance between your house. So some people will have, so we're always worried about window strikes with birds. Uh, so having your feeder either really close to your window or like a good 10 feet away from your window uh, is a good way to kind of minimize any of that potential of happening. Mm. But I would say if I had one choice of one thing to do, that would be putting up a, putting out water. That's like the biggest thing. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Uh, Candace mentions that Portland Audubon's website has some good resources. <laughs> Yeah, backyard yeah. habitat tips as well yeah yeah um yeah there's tons of resources out there um hopefully audubon and wild diversity will be doing some more online stuff so yeah. keep an eye out um yeah if no one has any questions i want to say thank you for being coming here and listening to me um let's give a like yays to greg for being so awesome today yeah um, definitely and, appreciate your time yeah i yeah, if you have any questions, contact Mercy. Mercy can give out my email to folks. I don't mind answering questions outside of that. I think like the biggest thing sometimes with birding is that birders create this like, this is ours, you can't come in. Um, and it should be for everybody. So if you have any questions, I'm more than willing to like look at a weird blurry photo of a bird if you got one. So. <laughs> yeah, Greg's a great resource. I'm always making like horrible bird calls to Greg and be like, so what was that? And Greg's like, I don't really. <laughs> 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 so maybe blurry photos would go a long way. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I hope you got a lot of good information that you're going to use and We'll try to schedule something like this again. Cool. Appreciate it. <laughs> See ya.
Y'all take care of yourselves. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>